This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Stick around to the end to see how you can save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. As NBA fans, one of the most fun things to do in the offseason for teams is set expectations. However, with expectations comes scrutiny and eventually disappointment. And that's what this video is about. Part one covered the pleasant surprises of the season, but now we're gonna talk about the stuff that makes us sad. Let's get negative, baby. Before I get on with this video, please subscribe to this channel for damn near daily NBA playoff content. Also go subscribe to my second channel where you're getting daily playoff content as well, but it is more like post game recaps rather than the more polished stuff you're getting over here. I'm trying to hit 100K on that channel by the end of the playoffs, so your subscription would be much appreciated there. Also drop a like, it only takes one second and makes a massive difference in how the video performs in the algorithm. So real quick, let's get the obvious one out of the way. I have declared the Lakers as the single most disappointing team in NBA history, and obviously that happened this year. To enter the season with the expectation of being a good playoff team at the very least, and in most people's eyes, a contender, and to fall so comically short of those expectations that you don't even make the play-in tournament? Obviously, this team is a huge disappointment, the biggest team disappointment ever, and the biggest of 2022. For a more in-depth explanation as to why I believe this is the most disappointing team of all time, feel free to go watch my video on the subject. Now, that's not the only obvious thing to address, there's also just the stuff that kind of happens every year. Players and teams that we hoped would break out, or at the very least have good seasons not doing that, hell, players and teams just regressing in general. General. Look at like Julius Randle and the Knicks, for example. The Hawks, who made a conference finals run last year, now just being a play-in team. Injuries are obvious. We don't want to see star players like Zion Williamson or Jamal Murray or Kawhi Leonard or Anthony Davis miss a ton of time, if not all of it, outside of AD in that example. But what is most disappointing is when these injuries seriously affect the Cinderella seasons that teams are having in the seedings. The Bulls and the Cavs are a higher seed with injuries removed from the equation for sure. The Bulls missed key defenders and that plummeted their defensive rating and eventually they lost their identity altogether as a result of this. And this caused them to fall from the first seed to the sixth seed. And the Cavs fell from a top five seed all the way to out of the damn playoffs altogether through the play-in tournament. But unfortunately, that's just kind of how it is. We experience injuries kind of ruining the fun every single year. But with that obvious stuff and the Lakers out of the way, we can finally move on to some stuff that's a little less obvious. Foul baiting. Remember when that wasn't allowed for like the first two months of the season? That was nice. Yeah, that rule change really did not stick around like you would have liked it to, and honestly, I think it's for simple reasons. It's not as though the rule got changed back to what it was, it's been a matter of its enforcement. And honestly, I think foul baiting has become so ingrained in the minds of referees that when they made a conscious effort to stamp it out, they could, but as time progressed, they got looser and looser with it until the rule change might as well have never happened. This is frustrating because there's there are very few basketball fans who like seeing foul baiting and really the ones who claim to actually enjoy it are just James Harden fans who are in denial or actually just sick bastards. Overall, it is an ugly, impure part of the game that yeah, might have been technically allowed, but it was unfair and arguably just as importantly, not entertaining. This is an entertainment product after all. In general, in regards to officiating, I am not prone to get angry towards it, and that's as someone who is very prone to get angry out of nothing. In fact, most of the time when I'm talking about officiating, I'm bitching about the people who are bitching about it, and I also don't blame players for taking the rules and the ref's blind spots and using it to their advantage. But I get very angry with foul baiting because at a fundamental level, it is not what basketball should be, and it ruins the viewing experience. Now, I put James Harden in the thumbnail for two reasons. One is that he's kind of the representative of foul baiting, even if I think it's unfair that he gets so much of the blame for it, he is the face of it at the end of the day. And second is what went down with him and the Brooklyn Nets this year. Now, it could be argued that this wasn't a disappointing development because a lot of people rooted for this team's downfall, and this trade was kind of the team's downfall. And hell, I definitely played a part in that, but in general, it kind of was a similar feeling 
that I had to the 2017 Warriors. I didn't want that team to exist when it did, and if you ask me if I'm cool with that team coming back just magically poofing into existence and being in the NBA again, I would definitely say no. But at least in hindsight, I'm glad I got to see what that much talent on the floor together fully realized could look like. Same goes with Harden on the Nets. The prospect of seeing three of the, like, bare minimum top ten greatest isolation scores of all time on the same team. Obviously, that was compelling, even if it seemed overpowered. And outside of a first round matchup versus the Boston Celtics in 2021, we have not really seen these three players at full force together. It was because of injury last year, then now this year it was injury and internal drama, and now that James has been traded, we're not never gonna really see it and thus that has made this one of the biggest what if teams of all time whether you were rooting for or against the nets it's a shame that this core did not get a true opportunity though having such a large-scale trade in the middle of the season is good and i was very happy to see ben simmons end up in brooklyn so it definitely did have its positive sides another weird thing that's disappointing to me and might not be disappointing to others is that some of the award races and specifically the mvp race did not narrow down more. I realize a lot of people find enjoyment in the MVP race being tight to close the year, but personally for me, I like to be pretty certain who my pick is by the end of the year, and I like the general NBA community to be relatively on one side. Main reason I feel this way is I like to avoid stupid and overly harsh discourse that always comes with the MVP race and we're seeing right now. In a hotly contested MVP year, you have to hear everyone's take on who really should have won it, and then you have to go into this endless cycle of tearing down one player to prop up another, and frankly, I just don't like dealing with that shit. I like MVP races like 2016, where we all knew who it was, and now we can move on with our lives and we don't have to talk about it every other month for another couple decades. And to add on top of that, I really can just say in general, I have been disappointed with discourse from fans and media this year. Of course, I already had pretty low expectations because what area would you have high expectations for NBA media? But even as I lower the bar and lower it and lower it and lower it, I still manage to be disappointed. It's gotten to the point where I feel like it's both an obligation to point out the stupid shit like Nick Wright claiming Jokic is an advanced stat only player and then a bunch of biased Philly fans running with that. But I also just don't want to confront it. I hate it so much I want to roll up into a ball and scream into the void. It gets worse and worse every year, and I don't expect it to get better. And luckily, I don't have to end on such a sad note because I actually have something positive to talk about before this video ends. Before I let you go, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Chances are, if you've been on YouTube long enough, you have heard about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace, and that is for good reason. Squarespace is a great way to create your own website, whether you are using it to market your own business, where you can use Squarespace's extensions, which help you manage inventory, products, bookkeeping, and shipping around the globe, or using it to create a community with features including comments, replies, and likes. You can create blogs and categorize, schedule, and share your posts on different social media platforms. Through Squarespace, you can connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content, manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights all on one easy-to-use platform. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash rustybuckets to save 10% off of your first purchase of a web Website or domain. Again, that is squarespace.com slash rusty buckets to save 10% off of your first purchase. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And that is the end of this video. Please be sure to like, subscribe for more content like this, and cue the outro music.